Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! Thank you for tuning in this uh, Monday, Monday morning, 25 minutes before 10 o'clock. We've been having some phone issues, but it sounds like they're fixed, so I'm happy about that. Our next guest is somebody we've been looking forward to speaking to, so I am uh, I was a little bit relieved when I found out that the phone sounded pretty good now. Kate Clark Flora is on the phone. Uh, my goodness, listen to this. She's a former assistant attorney general for the state of Maine. That and enough. That right there is enough for me to say, let's give her a whole half hour to talk to her. She also happens to be a very prolific author. She's written 12 books, uh, an Edgar Award finalist for her true crime work. Um, she has also been shortlisted for the Derringer Award and a finalist for the Maine Literary Award. Then it goes on and on and on from there. Her book is called Death Dealer. And here's another fascinating thing. How Cops and Cadaver Dogs Brought a Killer to Justice. I think, think it's a novel, right, Robin? It's a novel. Yeah. Okay. But I have a question for Kate as well. And first, let me just say good morning to her. Good morning, Kate. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Larry. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, I got a little bit of a cold, and I'm going to use oh. that to actually ask you a question. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> okay. All right. So, I, so where are you first? Are you in Maine right now? Oh, actually, I'm at the New England Library Association conference, and I'm sitting in a parking lot in some place called Boxborough, Massachusetts. Oh, a parking lot. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm, in, I'm sitting in a parking lot. Oh, my goodness. Well, I hope you're enjoying yourself, and I hope you're comfortable. It's not cold out there, is it? It's cold. It's nippy this morning, but it's been gorgeous. Oh, okay, okay. Well, here's, here's my thing. I started getting a cold last Wednesday or Thursday, and now it's Monday. And so uh, Joe, who works here with us, he, uh, he said, well, you look like death warmed over. You sound like death warmed over. So it's the expression, death warmed over, that I want to ask you about. <laughs> <laughs> has nothing to do with my cold. What, how do you warm over? <laughs> I know you don't really know. I was just a silly thought I had when I was thinking about your book. Uh, how did you take two seemingly different directions in your life and, and do them simultaneously? It sounds like you know, working as uh, an assistant attorney general for the state of Maine is not exactly the same mindset as somebody who would write a novel. Well, you know, I'm, 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 I, I no longer practice law, so now my mindset is entirely in the world of, of, of crime, but crime in the form of fiction. But Death Dealer is not a novel. Death Dealer is actually a true story. Oh, okay. Well, that makes oh, it nice. even more interesting. Yeah. Do you know the, the, yeah. ca the cadaver dogs interest me a lot? How do we train dogs... How do we do that? How does that happen? Well, it happens slowly and with a lot of patience and by choosing the right dog, a dog that loves to work, a dog that loves to play, a dog that uh, will work very hard all day for the reward of getting to play with its ball or its little tug-of-war toy or its favorite treat. Uh, and you start, you know, training them very slowly uh, with other kinds of scent work, and then gradually expose them to cadaver scent. Uh, you know, I've I've gone out on these you know, trainings with the dogs and their handlers, both with the main warden service and with volunteer groups. And you know, they will have a block of land, and they will have cadaver scent hidden somewhere. Sometimes buried in the ground, sometimes above ground, sometimes up a tree. And it's the dog's job to find that. Wow. Um, now, part of your book has to do with domestic violence. Is is the the killer that is referenced in the subtitle? Is that is this the main person, or, or do you cover more than one uh, one killer in the book? <laughs> this case, I, I, I you know, in in my fiction world, I write police procedurals, and this I would call a real live police procedural. This is following a, a homicide case from the day that they get their first call suggesting there's a missing person all the way through all of the investigations, the first, uh, first the, the trial, the second trial, all of the appeals, and seven years later, finally getting justice for the victim. Oh, my goodness. You know, in um, 
when, when you look at a painting, you, you'll see a, p- a picture of a tree that doesn't look quite right. And then when you're driving down the road, you'll see a tree that doesn't look quite right. And you say, well, maybe, maybe the tree in the painting did look like that. And, and, and the reason I'm saying that is because sometimes I think, you know, it's a cliche that if sometimes truth is weirder than, fa- f- than fiction um, or that you couldn't make this stuff up. That kind of statement is made. So as somebody who can make up a story... Did you find that this story had twists and turns that if you were writing it as a novel, nobody would have believed? Um, well, that's a good. That's a great question. Uh, you know, I think that it, I think you're right that when we write crime fiction, and I underline fiction, that we often are held to a higher standard because we're writing for the TV audience that's all conditioned by you know, and 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 by and the reading audience. You know, our crime readers are so sophisticated. They really know about crime scene technique. In the real world, things get botched up all the time. There often isn't that smoking gun. There may be DNA. There may yeah, not be, yeah. uh, you know. So it, writing the real is, is interesting because, but, but still, you know, a story like this has the same kind of natural drama that fiction does. Why do some people always think that murder is the solution and uh, not divorce? Well, in this particular case, uh, as you may know, because I think you've read the book, uh, murder was the solution because the uh, couple's marriage was deteriorating, and she was the keeper of his secrets. And he had this was not his first homicide, and he, you know, so for him, uh, if they split up, she would no longer have the incentive to keep his secrets, and so she represented not just a domestic annoyance or a frustration uh, in his life, but she also represented a real danger, in his opinion. Oh, wow. And, and, and when did this all take place? Uh, the, uh, the, the victim in this book, uh, Death Dealer, went missing in 2003, in January. And uh, were you actually working with this particular case? Oh, I'm looking at the pictures now in the book. Yeah. Look. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Nope. Oh, you're a pretty lady. Oh, wow, look at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, my mother, my mother-in-law used to say, you know, that sweet girl, those awful books. <laughs> but, um, so so, you know, so um, did you work I with... Not, I did not work with these guys. Okay. Uh, what happened in this... And this is a Canadian crime. This, and I was a, a lawyer in Maine. Uh, this actually came to me because the first true crime that I wrote, I, I wrote, I co-wrote with a police chief, and uh, he was the you know the investigator on the case. And the only way that the body in that case was found was because the main game wardens, who had trained cadaver dogs, actually came into the case and uh, conducted this in, and and conduct, organized the investigation, organized the search that actually found the body, so that they could go ahead and prove that there was a death and have a prosecution. And those wardens came back to me and said, so, Kate, when you're ready, we've got another one for you. Oh, really? And, yeah. Oh, wow. And, you know, wow. Was, was it like working, though, as, as you're writing a story? Was it similar to what you would have done as an attorney? Uh, no, uh, because when, when I, was, I, I did primarily civil stuff. I, did, I mean, I did battered kids and I did deadbeat dads, but I did the civil side. Um, you know, the real, the real connection, I would say, between, you know, having been a, a lawyer and, having, and becoming a crime writer is this whole question of good and evil, you know, because there are, there are people who are doing bad things and telling lies and cheating and, you know, being driven by greed and, you know, their sense of entitlement in every phase of the law. That's absolutely true. Boy, that is really true. People. Yeah, if we could figure out how to stop that, that would save the rest of us, wouldn't it? It would help us a lot. You're right, Larry. And it's uh, uh, very amazing to me that someone can be uh, in a relationship all those many years and still not really know the other person intimately. Well, you know, she thought she did, and don't people often. You know, I mean, when I was doing domestic relations law, I sometimes would say that if you talk to the husband and you talk to the wife, uh, they not only hadn't been married for 20 years, they had never met. Their stories were so divergent. Mm-hmm. So, oh wow! 
Um, that's, that's humans. Kate, Kate, we need to take a little break for the weather, and uh, but we'll be back in about two and a half minutes, and, and we'll chat with you off the air as well during the break. Um, we'll be right back. Kate Clark Flora is our guest. Up in Massachusetts, sitting in the car in a parking lot. And it's cold. We'll be right back. <laughs> Weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. Mostly sunny today with a high of 82 to 87. Then partly cloudy tonight, a low of 62 to 69. Clouds and some sunshine tomorrow. A shower or thunderstorm in spots in the afternoon. The high 83 to 86. And then on Wednesday, intervals of clouds and sunshine with a high of 81 to 85 degrees. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Evan Duffy. Howdy, folks. Did you know you can sell your mobile home today for fast cash? That's right. You can sell your mobile home today for fast cash. Just call one 844 my mh today for a cash offer on your mobile home. That's one 844 my mh today for a cash offer on your mobile home. You can also visit our Fancy Pants website at www.mobilehomecashout.com. That's www.mobilehomecashout.com. We buy ugly mobile homes and the pretty ones. Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. right here on The Source, WOCA. Don't miss planning for a better and safer retirement with your hosts, Francois Cousinet and Julianne Cousinet. They'll be giving you information about your retirement funds and answering your questions with live call-in. So don't miss it Saturdays from 9 a.m. till 10 a.m. Planning for a better and safer retirement right here on The Source, WOCA 96.3 FM, 1370 a.m. Cookies, 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 cookies. Wait, when you want something cookies, special cookies. and fun for any occasion, get cookies. That's right. The Great American Cookie Company in the Paddock Mall Ocala will make a delicious, fun-filled delight just for you. You might notice that I said fun and delicious more than once. That's because I can't say it enough. The next time you're at the mall, be sure and stop by or call 352-237-2557 to place your order. Cookies, cookies, Yum. cookies, cookies. We go cookie-eating cookies. The Great American Cookie Company. Now is the time to take advantage of Florida Credit Union CD specials. Our 36-month CD comes in at 1.26% APY. A 24-month is working for you at 1.0% APY. And our 12-month at 0.75% APY. All CD rate specials require $10,000 minimum. With friendly service and rates like these, it's not hard to see why Florida Credit Union has your CD options covered. Florida Credit Union, connecting your money to your life. Call 352-237-8222 for more information. Must act by 115.14. You've got a garden and we've got a show for you called You've Got a Garden with your host, Master Gardener Carol Ann Baldwin. Carol Ann answers your questions about your flowers, your veggies, your grass, your trees, even questions about your bugs. And she's only on WOCA, so don't miss Carol Ann Baldwin and You've Got a Garden each Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. right here on WOCA The Source. W-O-C-A. All right, boy. Commercials take a long time when you have an interesting guest, don't they? Yeah. Uh, Kate Clark Flora is on the phone up in Massachusetts, sitting in her car in a parking lot, cold, <laughs> talking about a book that is awesome. It's called Death Dealer, How Cops and Cadaver Dogs Bring a Killer, uh, Brought a Killer to Justice. The killer is, hold on, I just looked at his name, David Tanasichuk. And I think if it was fiction, you would have come up with an easier last name. <laughs> I think you're probably right. You know, it took me a little. I, one of the hardest parts of writing the book was learning to say Tennessee Chuck. You know. Oh, that's how you say it, Tennessee Chuck. Yeah. Wow. And where is he now? Uh, I'm sorry. Where is he now? He's, yeah. Uh, in prison for life. Because of the work I'm, you did. Well, because of the work the cops did. My mm. my job. My job. I get. I basically, sometimes I. I, I, I I told the cops up in Miramichi in Brunswick last week that uh, I, I see myself as a translator. I kind of stand in that place between, you know, police procedure and investigative procedure and the reader, and I sort of take you behind the scenes and say, this is what's really going on when you read a headline. This is what's really happening when you see police are investigating or police talk to or so-and-so is a person of interest. But what I think makes this book particularly dramatic in that respect is that this is one of those cases where the bad guy who was well known to the cops flipped things and he began stalking them and their families. So that yeah, it takes uh, upon a real dramatic urgency that is not present in a normal investigation. Uh, and, and he was his personality was so believable that 
the um, uh, police were even endeared to him. I'm sorry, endeared to him? Yes, it, he, he was uh, so believable in his statements that oh, yes. in, in, in the beginning they... In the beginning. And, and in the beginning, of course, they had a very different relationship with him because they were dealing with him as the victim or as a secondary victim because... Uh -oh. Sorry about that noise. Uh, but, you know, the, the, their child had been murdered. And, you know, police have a special relationship with murder victims so that they had become friends. And, you know, so he thought he could fool the cops into believing the story that he was telling when he showed up and said, my wife is missing and I'm worried. Now, now he took a long time to report her missing. If he killed her, why would he even report her missing at all? Or is that necessary? Because... <laughs> because um, she was, uh, and she was, she was a very quiet, sort of reclusive woman. She, but she had really good friends, really close friends, and her close friends uh, did not believe the story that she'd gone away uh, to visit someone because she was a housebound person. She didn't travel, and she certainly, if she had gone to visit someone, she would have told them, and she would have been in touch. And so when you know when she kept not appearing, and he kept saying, well, and he kept telling different stories. And they were all getting together. Right, right. They really call me. She's left on such and such. You know, uh, it was it was him catching himself in his own lies because he wasn't careful with them. With 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 all the lies that are obvious to everybody who was around a person like that. And and evidence maybe, I don't know if you call it circumstantial evidence, but it looks like maybe he didn't. That she didn't run away. That he killed her without a body. Could they have any case at all? Well, there have been prosecutions without bodies, but they're rare. Uh, you know, every once in a while there will be somebody where the circumstantial case is so strong. Uh, in this case, I think the police felt that they really did need a body, and of course the body, as, as we know from watching all those TV forensics shows, hmm. uh, bodies can give you a tremendous amount of information, and in this case... Uh, the murder weapon and the caliber and the time of year and, you know, all of those kinds of, and how she was killed, which turned out to be sort of critical in terms of assessing the story that they already knew. And uh, uh, she she had her own fight uh, for her own self. I mean, she overcame uh, drug use and uh, she was really on the straight and narrow and everything, but David continued on with his. Oh, yeah. I mean, David, David was... You know, David, 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 well, I think, I think that, you know, there's that wonderful uh, quote from Othello where, you know, it, he says he loved not wisely but too well, which I think would be Maria Tennessee-Chuck's flaw, that, you know, David was the center of her universe, and mm -hmm. she would do anything for him. And she trusted him and believed he would never be violent toward her, even though he had a massive history of violence. Wow, and doesn't that sound familiar? I mean, it's it's scary because how many women do do you know? I, I don't know that I know any right now, actually. But I mean, in the course of my life, they, you you see, and and I know this probably goes the other way too, where it's the guy who's being battered. But I don't know. I see more of it that the other way. I think mm -hmm. where there's a woman who just for some reason won't see that the guy she's with is really. She could do so much better. I mean, in, in, yeah. and I don't just mean in, in a in a cut down way. I mean, but in an actual not loving her way and cutting her and, and you know making fun of her, bullying her. We see it all the time, and they stay with them. I don't understand it at all. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think there was some really, really intelligent and interesting stuff written about the Ray Rice case that sort of does goes into some of the analyses of why women stay and uh you know and it's really sad but you know there are there are people who just you know love blindly and and hope is eternal yeah i hope that they they'll get they'll, they'll turn around yeah and these guys are so good at manipulating that you know they they're so apologetic and they you know they they, they sort of court the women after the violence and this cycle goes on and on uh, gosh. Well, maybe the, maybe a book like yours will help some of them get away from some of that. I hope. I mean, is, well, what, I hope. was there what was it, was there an actual uh, mission in your mind, like in writing the book? Is it, was it mostly about telling the story, or was there an actual hope that somebody would maybe change their their path in life? I think we always hope that. You know, I think those of us who are, I think crime writing, strangely enough, is an extremely moral field. 
despite all the violence that goes on in our books, I think that one of the things that we can do in, and in more in fiction, but in a book like this too, in, in fiction, we're trying to, you know, re- reassert the moral order and make the world safe again. And in this book, I think that one of the things that's really significant is the amount of energy and dedication that those detectives put into getting justice for Maria. Uh, they weren't going to give up. You know, when, when they didn't have a body, when they hit dead end after dead end, when their families were threatened and they lived with this constant fear, and when they were exhausted and they had no place else to turn, they just refused to give up. And so, you know, one of the things I write about is victims and giving something back to victims. Another thing that I write about is we see an awful lot of, you know, bad stuff that cops do or bad stuff being written about cops. And we don't so often see the heroic side, and I think there is one. Oh yeah, and and, and outweighs it. I've, my dad was a policeman, and uh, Robin's mom worked for the police department. And one of the things that we hear a lot, from, not just from the, the two people we're related to, but from a lot of the guests we have that are in law enforcement, is that, and I, I don't know how true this is. I'm going to use the figure ninety percent. It might be wrong, but ninety percent of the time they know who did it, like like within three minutes. But they can't. But it's it's the job of proving who did it. That's the hard part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are whodunits. There are absolutely whodunits. And then there are those random things, you know, the guy passing through town, uh, the serial killer who just moves from place to place, who's really good at this. And then you need the departments talking to each other and, you know, sort of to build the picture of the M.O. But you're right. I mean, a huge amount of the time, it's a small number of people committing the vast majority of crimes. And the police know that. And as the outsider, you not only had to earn the trust of the law law enforcement officials you worked with, but of uh, Maria's family as well. Right. Exactly. And that was, you know, and to me, I, I mean, I. One of the things that that I realize is that I'm incredibly grateful. I'm grateful that these cops were willing to give me access, and I'm very grateful to Maria's family and friends who were terrified of the bad guy. You know, they were afraid yeah, of David, yeah. and they were willing to come forward and talk to me and talk in court, and that's hard. You know, going back to the the statement that I was implying earlier that uh, writing a novel, sometimes you force twists and turns, whereas whereas we think in the real world, a crime, from, from the crime to the solving of the crime, it's a straight line, uh, but novelists will make twists and turns. Well, it sounds like there were twists and turns in this real story, and maybe this is more true than I realized. Mm-hmm. I think it is. I think it, I mean, I think that uh, one of the things that I, I have, you know, really enjoyed doing in both uh, Death Dealer and in the earlier one, Finding Amy, which was another murder with a hidden body, uh, is to sort of see how they analyze, how they, you know, go down. They, it's like working your way to a maze, you know. You talk to somebody, and then you may, three weeks later, talk to someone else who will illuminate something the first person said, and suddenly that will give you an opening and a direction to go in. Uh, you know, but if you've got nobody, you've got no witnesses, uh, you've not got no crime scene, you know, you're really up against a wall. And uh, you've learned how to you've learned how victims feel firsthand because they used you as part of the uh, dog's training to play a victim. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't have to be dead. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but that's wow. pretty yeah. admirable in itself. How close how close can a dog be to a cadaver before it discovers it? Uh, it depends. I mean, that 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 depends on probably about another three and a half days worth of conversation, Larry. Uh, <laughs> as I describe it, I mean, you know. It's, it's, is it buried? Is it above ground? What time of year is it? What are the weather yeah. conditions? Which way is the wind blowing? How good is the dog? Uh, how old is the scent? You know, there's a million things that influence all of that. But these, you know, you talk to these trainers, and it's just the most fascinating stuff in the world because, you know, they can actually sometimes have a uh, scent which is coming off a body, but because of the way the wind is blowing and the contours of the land, the cadaver scent will pool half a mile from where the body actually is, and they also almost have to do geometry to figure out, oh, wow. okay, wow. where did it come from? Where is it most likely that we should look next? I have a copy of Kate's book. It's called Death Dealer. Call me if you want the copy that was sent to us. Uh, the rest of us have to go buy it. Look for her name, Kate Clark Flora. And uh, do you have a, way, a website, Kate? I do. It's kateflora.com. Kateflora.com, okay. Uh, and How about that? 
Okay, that's pretty easy. F L O R A, uh, and is the book on Amazon, etc. It is absolutely. Okay, well, th- uh, get inside. It's cold out there. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I have to go. I have to go talk to the librarian. Really <laughs> thank you, Kate. Thank you for being on the air with us today. Oh, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Robin. This is great. All right, we will take a little break, and we'll be right back. Matt Gibbs is up next to answer your questions about your cars. This is the Source W O C A Ocala. Fox News Radio, I'm Pat O'Neill. A new move to deal with Ebola. The Pentagon's forming a new rapid response support team for U.S. medical personnel treating Ebola patients. Rear Admiral John Kirby telling Fox News... They're going to-